Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. All right, today we're going to be taking a quick look at Spire's End. This is a new game recently delivered to Kickstarter backers, a game by Gregory Favro with illustrations by Benjamin Weissman. And right off the bat, Benjamin Weissman, you knocked it out of the park on this game. Good God, the art in this game is awesome. Um, like I said, this is a new Kickstarter game. This is one of those weird reviews where I'm not really sure what the purpose... It's not really a review. It's one of those weird videos where I'm not really sure what the purpose of the video is. Because if I make this game look and sound good and you want to get it, it's like not available anymore or in very limited quantities. You know, it's one of those weird Kickstarter videos where it's like made for people who backed the game to congratulate them on backing a good game I guess I don't know uh, yeah well <laughs> we'll have to see uh, so I was not aware of this game when it was on Kickstarter a dungeon dive viewer asked me about it a week or so ago and I looked into it I fell in love with the art I immediately contacted the designer and asked him if I could buy a copy and he had a few copies left so he sold me one i cannot find that comment and i can't remember who you were so if you were the person who recommended this game to me please leave a comment here so i can thank you and you can get the credit that you deserve so spire's end what is spire's end spire's end is a game in a genre that is becoming well, we're getting enough games in this genre that it is becoming a genre. And that is the card-based adventure game. Think, you know, the Choose Your Own Adventure card games that are coming out. Um, Escape the Dark Castle. Escape the Dark Sector. Um, maybe Legends Untold. Um, what else? I know I'm forgetting at least, at least one or two. I guess kind of the Warhammer Quest card game, but these are smaller box games that kind of emulate board games in dungeon crawling or in adventure games, but they do so with just a deck of cards. And this game I would say is more complex than Escape the Dark Sector. So if you were to rate these or you were to put these in, in, a, in a list from like the Choose Your Own Adventure being the most simple and then maybe Escape the Dark Castle and then Escape the Dark Sector, then maybe I would put like Spire's End and then maybe like Legends Untold or the Warhammer Quest game maybe above that. So it's 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 a little more complex. There's there's quite a bit more going on than Escape the Dark Sector and Escape the Dark Castle, but it's not super complicated. With that being said, I still think it's pretty difficult to win and I do have a little bit of issues with the combat. We'll talk about that a little bit. But let's back up and give a um, just a, a really brief overview. So you're going to be working your way through a large deck of cards. There are six chapters. You are probably going to see a little bit of spoilers here up through about midway through chapter two. I'm not going to give anything really away, but just be wary of that. If you are, you know, if you're sensitive to seeing anything, you may just not want to watch the rest of this video. But you're going to start with a prologue, and the prologue is going to have a few cards here. And what's interesting is that you're going to read the prologue and Google the amazing art. Um, it was unusually dark before the moon was swallowed in red. Crimson light circled the dark orb like bloodshot raven's eyes. The ground shook and something unimaginable drilled its way out of the earth. It tore through the town with ungodly force. The streets filled with fumes and the townsfolk fell into a deep unnatural sleep. The strong the frail and the innocent all disappeared under the red eclipse. 
The spire stood there in silence. At its base was a door left ajar. So you're going to go to uh, card two in the prologue, and you're going to read a little bit about the adventure. And then this um, instructs you to go ahead and read the instruction deck. So in this game, all of the instructions are also on these same oversized cards. Everything in the game fits in this small box. Now the instructions being on cards, I'm of two minds on that. One, I do like that there was an attempt to keep things in this like cohesive vision, this design aesthetic. You guys know I like that a lot. I like when everything about a game fits into a single aesthetic vision. And that, this game definitely does that in spades. But I, I almost wish that maybe it just came with a book that was the same size here. But it's okay. So you're going to be reading through the, um, the instruction cards. And they're going to tell you how to set up. They're going to tell you a little bit about the terminology, how you explore the deck of story cards, the differences between revealing a card, pulling a card, what you do with discarded cards. So you will learn about all of that. They're going to tell you how to set up your allies. So basically, you are the player. You are you. And you are going to be accompanied by these amazing allies with... God, I just love this art. The black and white, the old formatting paper for the shading. And then just with these, um, these red accents are super cool. So there are seven allies and you have to, you, you have to make it through the entire game without getting all of these killed. These are basically your lives. And these are going to be the people who are helping you fight and helping you get through your adventure. You have Millicent, the silk weaver, you have Wolf, the kill cow. You've got Sedony, the silversmith. Dane, the rudderkin. And then right now in my party, I have um, Hildegard, the endrake, and Leo Frick, the forester. And so these are going to be your characters in your party. And each one of them is gonna have a number of stats. You're gonna have a certain number of health and a certain number of, of armor. The health is a resource that you will also be spending and you don't want to go to zero. If you go to zero health and zero armor, you are of course dead and that ally is discarded and you have to draw a new one. You always have two allies. But health is also a resource and you are going to be spending that resource to initiate different attacks when you are in combat. So all of the characters have a zero cost, really basic attack. So if you wanted to do that attack, you would spend zero health. Then you would have to roll a D8. And if you rolled a five or seven, you would do one damage. If you rolled an eight, you would do one damage and A, which A is a surge or B is a stun. So you have these special attacks that trigger keywords. And all of the keywords are ni nicely listed on this um, card here for the status effects glossary. And then you also have a card over here that you can use all of these, some of these cubes that the game comes with, red, black, clear, and yellow cubes. And you can use those to keep track of the different positive statuses or negative statuses for the enemies and your allies. So really nice card over there to keep track of statuses and because you're going to keep track of them throughout different rounds. And then finally, when a hero is killed, they're going to do this death move and that happens before they die. It's like one final surge of power that the ally gives you before it is vanquished. Uh, I guess you also have these uh, two things up here. This is for resting, so when you, um, one of the phases of the game is called recoup. And each of the characters has a special recoup action that they can use to heal or maybe do something else, a, separate, a secret power or something, a special power. And if you rest, you can build up your rest meter to where you will get a bonus on your recoup roll. You can also get something called a boost and where that is, if you heal and you overheal for the number of health that you have, 
then you can get boosted and that'll help you in certain ways throughout the game. So each of the characters does have a bunch of different attacks with different kind of bonuses and different status effects that they can use to help their other allies or to hinder the enemies. So yeah, the, the rules are, are, are pretty, they're, they're pretty good. They're not great. I've, um, there are a couple things that you kind of have to intuit on your own, but nothing, nothing that, you know, people who play these kinds of games would have any trouble dealing with. I could see maybe somebody who is new to adventure games, maybe having some difficulty in the first few rounds. All right, but like I said, so you're gonna be going through, you get through the, uh, the first of the prologue, then you go to the next prologue, then you're gonna look at the first card of chapter one. It's gonna tell you a little story, and then you face off against your first enemy here. And this is the enemy that you have to fight. He's the deck, the doorkeeper. He's the guy that's keeping you out of the spire and you have to get into the spire to find out what is going on. And so when you set up an enemy, you're going to set the enemy up in front of your character cards and then you're going to go through rounds of combat. Now, this, the combat in this game is pretty good. It, I think it draws on... A little it goes on for a little too long I think because the enemies do have quite a bit of health and quite a bit of armor most attacks you can't hit their health until you deplete the armor and so on um, I and you really are at the mercy of this d8 when I was fighting the doorman I rolled on my attack I rolled a one multiple times where I was just doing no damage at all and I actually ended up losing a ally. I lost a my first life on the very first combat encounter. And, um, and that was strictly because I kept rolling poorly on my D8. It came with this red D8, but I have banished this D8. I'm going to throw this D8 away because almost it felt like I rolled one or two for all of my attacks and I was constantly rolling eight for the enemy's attacks and yeah that d8 is cursed it is being banished but but the way that the um, enemies do their attack is you will have this um, deck of attack cards here that the enemy is going to use and you are going to draw one and then that is going to tell you what attack the enemy is going to do and then you roll a die, the D8, and on a one, two, three, or four, it attacks ally number one. On a five through eight, it attacks ally number two, and so on. So you are you know, dealing with, you're managing your health, you're spending health to do more powerful attacks, you're healing, you're recouping, you're hoping that your allies can hit those special key status effects to where they can do uh, more powerful attacks on the enemy or maybe help their allies and you're hoping that the enemy doesn't get a bunch of fives or sixes to where they're going to use their super powers to do more damage to you. I have seen one enemy that did something really cool with these attack cards. You were to, every time you drew one, you had to lay them out in a, um, in a row like this. And if there was a certain pattern of numbers or cards, then they would do a super attack. So that is really cool. I always like when games utilize their components in creative ways. I'm hoping to see more card, more items or enemies like that in the game that use the components in interesting ways. Another really cool thing about this game is you are going to um, run into situations where you will find keys and I'm just going to show you this one key here this is the first key pretty easy to get this is not really a spoiler but every time you get a key you are going to be able to roll one of these special d6s that are the key dice and at certain points throughout the adventure you're going to be coming across these locks and these locks will tell you to roll a number of key dice, d6, 
depending on how many keys you have in your inventory. And if you roll one of the symbols shown, then you have unlocked that lock. So that is really cool. I love that concept. I love that the components work together. You know, so if you have three keys, you get to roll three dice and maybe you have to get a certain combination of symbols. Maybe you only have to get one symbol, but the more keys you have, the more dice you get to roll and the better chances of unlocking these doors are. I think that is a really neat thing. It kind of like, it kind of like makes the, I don't know, it feels like it breaks the fourth wall a little bit. It, 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 it allows you as the player to kind of feel like you are getting into this world by manipulating the components in a kind of a Ludo narrative way. But yeah, so right now I am on card uh, 26. Again, a little ways in to act or chapter two. And I'll just read this for you guys and so you can get a little bit of taste for the, uh, the writing here. Crimson drapes of haunting vegetation stretch down the walls like blood. It's as if the corridor itself has suffered wounds that have never healed. Along the floor are streaks of slimy goo. Whatever could leak this volume of nastiness is certainly something to avoid. A few steps later, the floor changes. It turns from plain stone to decorative square tiles protruding slightly from the floor. They are adorned with the symbolism you have seen throughout the spire. Again, all of these symbols are on the dice. They are on the backs of the cards. So everything, like um, Escape the Dark Sector, which I recently reviewed, everything is theme forward in this game, which is very cool. Um, let's see. The slime trails flow along the tiles in a deliberate way. This looks to be a ritualistic occurrence. You must decide. I will only step on the tiles with the slime trail, or I will step I will not step on any tiles sullied by slime. Reveal card 28. So when you reveal a card, you find the card in the deck, and any card that you skip over, you actually take out of the game. So already, in just act one and two, I've already passed over quite a few cards. So I think there is some replay value in this game where you are not going to see everything on one playthrough, depending on the choices you make and what happens. So I need to go to card 28, which means I bypass card 27. That card is out of the game. So card 28, I follow the slime or I avoided the slime. So you would read whatever you chose on this card and then you would continue along that path. If you find items, you get to equip the items underneath your character's cards. If your allies die, then the items, I believe the items get to pass on. You don't, they don't, you don't lose items, I don't think. There is another card that is revealed pretty early in the game where you get to keep track of how many coins you have, how many keys you have, and um, stat bonuses to your health and armor. So like I said, this is not really a review. Oh, and um, any card that you have encountered that you have read and used goes into your discard and this is available to you at any time to kind of look through. And what the weird thing is, is some of the cards have these misprinted uh, ink on them. And the designer said that is on purpose. And some of the cards are, they, they already look beat up and that is all of a design choice. I'm not sure if these weird markings on the cards, I don't know if that has anything to do with the game, if that's like a puzzle, I, I am not sure, but I like the fact that that kind of stuff exists. It gives this game like a lived in world feeling that I think is super important to games like this. So, uh, so yeah, overall, I think this game is really cool. I have read that the designer designed this game to be a complete game. You know, it, it's one box. This is it. This is the entire game for Spire's End. 
I don't think we're going to have to worry about expansions. He has other games in the works, but I don't think he's going to be expanding Spires in. I think he's going to be moving forward, hopefully using this system and honing it and developing it. Maybe working on combat a little bit. I just... The, I've had two combats in this game so far, and both of them have just dragged on for a few turns longer than I really would have liked because I want to experience more of the story and make and have more of the decisions to be made. But if you can get your hands on this game, do it. If you like games like Escape the Dark Sector, Escape the Dark Castle, if you like games like the True Zone Adventure card games, if you like these, these card deck, deck of card based adventure and dungeon crawl games, this is a good one, and I have a, <laughs> I have a, just a great feeling about the future for this design team. I really hope they continue to work together uh, just to give us some of this fantastic art. I'm just going to flip through a few of the cards, so if you want to stop now, you can. But I just want to show you guys some of the other art and stuff. I'm just going to flip through them really quickly so you can get a taste of, of what is in store. So if you want to quit watching now, my thoughts on this game are super positive and that is Spire's End and now we're just going to do a quick flip through of some of the cards so you can see some of the art and some of the things that you will be encountering it's pretty exciting uh, really great design so yeah that's it that is a look at Spire's End a game by Gregory Favreau and illustrated by Benjamin Weissman. So, all right, guys. Well, thanks a lot. I hope you enjoyed this video, and we will talk to you later. Bye-bye.